Chapter 4, Part 2 of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 4, Part 2. The next day I made another voyage, and now, having plundered the ship of what was portable and fit to hand out, I began with the cables. Cutting the great cable into pieces, such as I could move, I got two cables and a hawser on shore, with all the ironwork I could get, and having cut down the spritsail yard and the mizzen yard, and everything I could, to make a large raft, I loaded it with all these heavy goods and came away. But my good luck began now to leave me, for this raft was so unwieldy and so overladen that, after I had entered the little cove where I had landed the rest of my goods, not being able to guide it so handily as I did the other, it overset and threw me and all my cargo into the water. As for myself, it was no great harm, for I was near the shore, but as to my cargo, it was a great part of it lost, especially the iron, which I expected would have been a great use to me. However, when the tide was out, I got most of the pieces of the cable ashore, and some of the iron, though with infinite labor." for I was fain to dip for it into the water, a work which fatigued me very much. After this I went every day on board, and brought away what I could get. I had been now thirteen days on shore, and had been eleven times on board the ship, in which time I had brought away all that one pair of hands could well be supposed capable to bring, though I believe verily, had the calm weather held, I should have brought away the whole ship, piece by piece, but preparing the twelfth time to go on board, I found the wind began to rise. However, at low water I went on board, and though I thought I had rummaged the cabin so effectually that nothing more could be found, yet I discovered a locker with drawers in it, in one of which I found two or three razors, and one pair of large scissors, with some ten or a dozen of good knives and forks. In another I found about thirty-six pounds value in money, some European coin, some Brazil, some pieces of eight, some gold, and some silver. I smiled to myself at the sight of this money. <laughs> oh, drug, said I aloud, what art thou good for? Thou art not worth to me, no, not the taking off the ground. One of those knives is worth all this heap. I have no manner of use for thee. E'en remain where thou art, and go to the bottom as a creature whose life is not worth saving. However, upon second thoughts, I took it away, and wrapping all this in a piece of canvas, I began to think of making another raft, but while I was preparing this, I found the sky overcast, and the wind began to rise, and in a quarter of an hour it blew a fresh gale from the shore. It presently occurred to me that it was in vain to pretend to make a raft with the wind off shore, and that it was my business to be gone before the tide of flood began, otherwise I might not be able to reach the shore at all. Accordingly, I let myself down into the water, and swam across the channel, which lay between the ship and the sands, and even that with difficulty enough, partly with the weight of the things I had about me, and partly the roughness of the water, for the wind rose very hastily, and before it was quite high water, it blew a storm. But I had got home to my little tent, where I lay, with all my wealth about me, very secure. It blew very hard all night, and in the morning, when I looked out, behold, no more ship was to be seen. I was a little surprised, but recovered myself with the satisfactory reflection that I had lost no time, nor abated any diligence to get everything out of her that could be useful to me, and that, indeed, there was little left in her that I was able to bring away, if I had had more time. I now gave over any more thoughts of the ship, or of anything out of her, except what might drive on shore from her wreck, as indeed divers piece of her afterwards did, but those things were of small use to me. My thoughts were now wholly employed about securing myself against either savages, if any should appear, or wild beasts, if any were in the island, and I had many thoughts of the method how to do this, and what kind of dwelling to make whether I should make me a cave in the earth, or a tent upon the earth, and, in short, I resolved upon both, the manner and description of which it may not be improper to give an account of. 
I soon found the place I was in was not fit for my settlement, because it was upon a low, moorish ground near the sea, and I believed it would not be wholesome, and more particularly because there was no fresh water near it. So I resolved to find a more healthy and more convenient spot of ground. I consulted several things in my situation, which I found would be proper for me. First, health and fresh water, I just now mentioned. Secondly, shelter from the heat of the sun. Thirdly, security from ravenous creatures, whether man or beast. Fourthly, a view to the sea, that if God sent any ship in sight, I might not lose any advantage for my deliverance, of which I was not willing to banish all my expectation yet. In search of a place proper for this, I found a little plain on the side of a rising hill, whose front towards this little plain was steep as a house-side, so that nothing could come down upon me from the top. On the one side of the rock there was a hollow place, worn a little way in, like the entrance or door of a cave, but there was not really any cave or way into the rock at all. On the flat of the green, just before this hollow place, I resolved to pitch my tent. This plain was not above a hundred yards broad, and about twice as long, and lay like a green before my door, and, at the end of it, descended irregularly every way down into the low ground by the seaside. It was on the north-northwest side of the hill, so that it was sheltered from the heat every day, till it came to a west and by south sun, or thereabouts, which in those countries is near the setting. Before I set up my tent I drew a half-circle before the hollow place, which took in about ten yards in its semi-diameter from the rock, and twenty yards in its diameter from its beginning and ending. In this half-circle I pitched two rows of strong stakes, driving them into the ground till they stood very firm like piles, the biggest end being out of the ground above five feet and a half, and sharpened on the top. The two rows did not stand above six inches from one another. Then I took the pieces of cable which I had cut in the ship, and laid them in rows, one upon another, within the circle, between these two rows of stakes, up to the top, placing other stakes in the inside, leaning against them, about two feet and a half high, like a spur to a post. And this fence was so strong that neither man nor beast could get into it or over it. This cost me a great deal of time and labor, especially to cut the piles in the woods, bring them to the place, and drive them into the earth. The entrance into this place I made to be, not by a door, but by a short ladder to go over the top, which ladder, when I was in, I lifted over after me, and so I was completely fenced in and fortified, as I thought, from all the world, and consequently slept secure in the night, which otherwise I could not have done though, as it appeared afterwards, there was no need of all this caution from the enemies that I apprehended danger from. Into this fence or fortress, with infinite labor, I carried all my riches, all my provisions, ammunition, and stores, of which you have the account above, and I made a large tent, which, to preserve me from the rains that in one part of the year are very violent there, I made double, one smaller tent within, and one larger tent above it and covered the uppermost with a large tarpaulin, which I had saved among the sails. And now I lay no more for a while in the bed which I had brought on shore, but in a hammock, which was indeed a very good one, and belonged to the mate of the ship. Into this tent I brought all my provisions, and everything that would spoil by the wet, and having thus enclosed all my goods, I made up the entrance, which till now I had left open, and so passed and repassed, as I said, by a short ladder. When I had done this, I began to work my way into the rock, and bringing all the earth and stones that I dug down out through my tent, I laid them up within my fence in the nature of a terrace, so that it raised the ground within about a foot and a half, and thus I made me a cave just behind my tent, which served me like a cellar to my house. It cost me much labor and many days before all these things were brought to perfection, and therefore I must go back to some other things which took up some of my thoughts. At the same time it happened, after I had laid my scheme for the setting up of my tent, and making the cave, that a storm of rain falling from the thick, dark cloud, a sudden flash of lightning happened, and after that a great clap of thunder, as is naturally the effect of it. 
I was not so much surprised with the lightning as I was with a thought which darted into my mind as swift as the lightning itself. Oh, my powder! My very heart sank within me when I thought that, at one blast, all my powder might be destroyed, on which not my defence only, but the providing of my food, as I thought, entirely depended. I was nothing near so anxious about my own danger, though. Had the powder took fire, I should never have known who had hurt me. Such impression did this make upon me, that after the storm was over, I laid aside all my works, my building and fortifying, and applied myself to make bags and boxes, to separate the powder, and to keep it a little and a little in a parcel, in the hope that, whatever might come, it might not all take fire at once, and to keep it so apart that it should not be possible to make one part fire another. I finished this work in about a fortnight, and I think my powder, which in all was about two hundred and forty pounds weight, was divided in not less than a hundred parcels. As to the barrel that had been wet, I did not apprehend any danger from that, so I placed it in my new cave, which, in my fancy, I called my kitchen, and the rest I hid up and down in holes among the rocks, so that no wet might come to it, marking very carefully where I laid it. In the interval of time while this was doing, I went out once at least every day with my gun, as well to divert myself as to see if I could kill anything fit for food, and as near as I could to acquaint myself with what the island produced. The first time I went out, I presently discovered that there were goats in the island, which was a great satisfaction to me. But then it was attended with this misfortune to me, that is, that they were so shy, so subtle, and so swift of foot, that it was even the most difficult thing in the world to come at them. But I was not discouraged at this, not doubting but I might now and then shoot one, as it soon happened. For after I had found their haunts a little, I laid wait in this manner for them. I observed if they saw me in the valleys, though they were upon the rocks, they would run away, as in a terrible fright. But if they were feeding in the valleys, and I was upon the rocks, they took no notice of me. From whence I concluded that, by the position of their optics, their sight was so directed downward that they did not readily see objects that were above them. So afterwards I took this method. I always climbed the rocks first to get above them, and then had frequently a fair mark. The first shot I made among these creatures I killed a she-goat, which had a little kid by her, which she gave suck to, which grieved me heartily, for when the old one fell, the kid stood stock still by her, till I came and took her up. And not only so, but when I carried the old one with me, upon my shoulders, the kid followed me quite to my enclosure, upon which I laid down the dam, and took the kid in my arms, and carried it over my pail, in hopes to have bred it up tame. But it would not eat, so I was forced to kill it, and eat it myself. These two supplied me with flesh a great while, for I ate sparingly, and saved my provisions, my bread especially, as much as possibly I could. Having now fixed my habitation, I found it absolutely necessary to provide a place to make a fire in, and fuel to burn. And what I did for that, and also how I enlarged my cave, and what conveniences I made, I shall give a full account of in its place. But I must now give some little account of myself, and of my thoughts about living, which, it may well be supposed, were not a few. I had a dismal prospect of my condition, for as I was not cast away upon that island without being driven, as is said, by a violent storm, quite out of the course of our intended voyage, and a great way, perhaps some hundreds of leagues, out of the ordinary course of the trade of mankind, I had great reason to consider it as a determination of heaven that in this desolate place and in this desolate manner I should end my life. The tears would run plentifully down my face when I made these reflections, and sometimes I would expostulate with myself why Providence should thus completely ruin his creatures, and render them so absolutely miserable, so without help, abandoned, so entirely depressed, that it could hardly be rational to be thankful for such a life. But something always returned swift upon me to check these thoughts, and to reprove me, and particularly one day, Walking with my gun in my hand by the seaside, I was very pensive upon the subject of my present condition, 
when reason, as it were, expostulated with me the other way, thus. Well, you are in a desolate condition, it is true. But, pray remember, where are the rest of you? Did not you come, eleven of you, in the boat? Where are the ten? Why were they not saved, and you lost? Why were you singled out? Is it better to be here or there? And then I pointed to the sea. All evils are to be considered with the good that is in them, and with what worse attends them. Then it occurred to me again how well I was furnished for my subsistence, and what would well have been my case if it had not happened, which was a hundred thousand to one, that the ship floated from the place where she first struck, and was driven so near the shore that I had time to get all these things out of her. What would have been my case if I had been forced to have lived in the condition in which I at first came on shore, without necessaries of life, or necessaries to supply and procure them? "'Particularly,' said I, aloud, though to myself, "'what should I have done without a gun, without ammunition, without any tools to make anything, or to work with, without clothes, bedding, a tent, or any manner of covering? And that now I had all these to sufficient quantity, and was in a fair way to provide myself in such a manner as to live without my gun, when my ammunition was spent, so that I had a tolerable view of subsisting, without any want, as long as I lived, for I considered from the beginning how I would provide for the accidents that might happen, and for the time that was to come, even not only after my ammunition should be spent, but even after my health and strength should decay. I confess I had not entertained any notion of my ammunition being destroyed at one blast. I mean my powder being blown up by lightning, and this made the thoughts of it so surprising to me when it lightened and thundered, as I observed just now. And now being about to enter into a melancholy relation of a scene of silent life, such, perhaps, as was never heard of in the world before, I shall take it from its beginning, and continue it in its order. It was by my account, the 30th of September, when, in the manner as above said, I first set foot upon this horrid island, when the sun, being to us in its autumnal equinox, was almost over my head, for I reckon myself, by observation, to be in the latitude of nine degrees twenty-two minutes north of the line. After I had been there about ten or twelve days, it came into my thoughts that I should lose my reckoning of time for want of books, and pen and ink, and should even forget the Sabbath days. But to prevent this, I cut with my knife upon a large post, in capital letters, and making it into a great cross, I set it up on the shore where I first landed. I came on shore here on the 30th September, 1659. Upon the sides of this square post I cut every day a notch with my knife, and every seventh notch was as long again as the rest, and every first day of the month as long again as that long one, and thus I kept my calendar, or weekly, monthly, and yearly reckoning of time. In the next place, we are to observe that among the many things which I brought out of the ship, in the several voyages which, as above mentioned, I made to it, I got several things of less value, but not at all less useful to me, which I omitted setting down before, as in particular, pens, ink, and paper, several parcels in the captain's, mate's, gunner's, and carpenter's keeping, three or four compasses, some mathematical instruments, dials, perspectives, charts, and books of navigation, all which I huddled together, whether I might want them or no, also I found three very good Bibles, which came to me in my cargo from England, and which I had packed up among my things. Some Portuguese books also, and among them two or three Popish prayer books, and several other books, all of which I carefully secured. And I must not forget that we had in the ship a dog and two cats, of whose eminent history I may have occasion to say something in its place, for I carried both the cats with me, and as for the dog— he jumped out of the ship of himself, and swam on shore to me the day after I went on shore with my first cargo, and was a trusty servant to me many years. I wanted nothing that he could fetch me, nor any company that he could make up to me. I only wanted to have him talk to me, but that would not do. As I observed before, 
I found pens, ink, and paper, and I husbanded them to the utmost, and I shall show that while my ink lasted, I kept things very exact, but after that was gone I could not, for I could not make any ink by any means that I could devise. And this put me in mind that I wanted many things notwithstanding all that I had amassed together, and of these ink was one, as also a spade, pickaxe, and shovel, to dig or remove the earth, needles, pins, and thread, as for linen I soon learned to want that without much difficulty. This want of tools made every work I did go on heavily, and it was near a whole year before I had entirely finished my little pail, or surrounded my habitation. The piles or stakes, which were as heavy as I could well lift, were a long time in cutting and preparing in the woods, and more by far in bringing home, so that I spent sometimes two days in cutting and bringing home one of those posts, and a third day in driving it into the ground, for which purpose I got a heavy piece of wood at first, but at last bethought myself of one of the iron crows, which, however, though I found it, made driving those posts or piles very laborious and tedious work. But what need I have been concerned at the tediousness of anything I had to do, seeing I had time enough to do it in? Nor had I any other employment, if that had been over, at least that I could foresee, except the ranging the island to seek for food, which I did more or less every day. I now began to consider seriously my condition and the circumstances I was reduced to, and I drew up the state of my affairs in writing, not so much as to leave them to any that were to come after me, for I was likely to have but few heirs, as to deliver my thoughts from daily poring over them, and afflicting my mind. And as my reason began now to master my despondency, I began to comfort myself as well as I could, and to set the good against the evil, that I might have something to distinguish my case from worse and I stated very impartially, like debtor and creditor, the comforts I enjoyed against the miseries I suffered, thus. On the evil side, I am cast upon a horrid, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. On the good side, but I am alive, and not drowned, as all my ship's company were. On evil, I am singled out and separated, as it were, from all the world, to be miserable. But I am singled out, too, from all the ship's crew, to be spared from death, and he that miraculously saved me from death can deliver me from this condition. I am divided from mankind, a solitaire, one banished from human society. But I am not starved, or perishing on a barren place, affording no sustenance. I have no clothes to cover me. But... I am in a hot climate, where, if I had clothes, I could hardly wear them. I am without any defense, or means to resist any violence of man or beast. But I am cast on an island where I see no wild beasts to hurt me, as I saw on the coast of Africa, and what if I had been shipwrecked there? I have no soul to speak to or relieve me. But God wonderfully sent the ship in near enough to the shore, that I have got out as many necessary things as will either supply my wants, or enable me to supply myself, even as long as I live. Upon the whole, here was an undoubted testimony that there was scarce any condition in the world so miserable, but there was something negative or something positive to be thankful for in it. And let this stand as a direction from the experience of the most miserable of all conditions in this world, that we may always find in it something to comfort ourselves from, and to set, in the description of good and evil, on the credit side of the account. Having now brought my mind a little to relish my condition, and given over looking out to sea, to see if I could spy a ship, I say, giving over these things, I began to apply myself to arrange my way of living, and to make things as easy to me as I could. I have already described my habitation, which was a tent under the side of a rock, surrounded with a strong pail of posts and cables, but I might now rather call it a wall, for I raised a kind of wall up against it of turfs, about two feet thick on the outside, and after some time, I think it was a year and a half, I raised rafters from it, leaning to the rock, 
and thatched or covered it with boughs of trees, and such things as I could get, to keep out the rain, which I found at some times of the year very violent. I have already observed how I brought all my goods into this pail, and into the cave which I had made behind me. But I must observe, too, that at first this was a confused heap of goods, which, as they lay in no order, so they took up all my place. I had no room to turn myself. So I set myself to enlarge my cave, and work farther into the earth, for it was a loose sandy rock, which yielded easily to the labor I bestowed on it. And so when I found I was pretty safe as to beasts of prey, I worked sideways, to the right hand, into the rock, and then, turning to the right again, worked quite out, and made me a door to come out on the outside of my pail or fortification. This gave me not only egress and regress, as it was a back way to my tent and to my storehouse, but gave me room to store my goods. And now I began to apply myself to make such necessary things as I found I most wanted, particularly a chair and a table, for without these I was not able to enjoy the few comforts I had in the world. I could not write, or eat, or do several things with so much pleasure without a table. So I went to work. And here I must needs observe that as reason is the substance and origin of the mathematics, so by stating and squaring everything by reason, and by making the most rational judgment of things, every man may be, in time, master of every mechanic art. I had never handled a tool in my life, and yet, in time, by labor, application, and contrivance, I found at last that I wanted nothing but I could have made it, especially if I had had tools. However, I made abundance of things, even without tools, and some with no more tools than an adze and a hatchet, which perhaps were never made that way before, and that with infinite labor. For example, if I wanted a board, I had no other way but to cut down a tree, set it on an edge before me, and hew it flat on either side with my axe, till I brought it to be thin as a plank, and then dub it smooth with my adze. It is true, by this method I could make but one board out of a whole tree, but this I had no remedy for but patience, any more than I had for the prodigious deal of time and labor which it took me up to make a plank or board, but my time or labor was little worth, and so it was well employed one way as another. However, I made me a table and a chair, as I observed above, in the first place, and this I did out of the short pieces of boards that I brought on my raft from the ship, but when I had wrought out some boards as above, I made large shelves, of the breadth of a foot and a half, one over another all along one side of my cave, to lay all my tools, nails, and ironwork on, and, in a word, to separate everything at large into their places, that I might come easily at them. I knocked pieces into the walls of the rock to hang my guns and all things that would hang up, so that, had my cave been to be seen, it looked like a general magazine of all necessary things, and had everything so ready at my hand that it was a great pleasure to me to see all my goods in such order, and especially to find my stock of all necessaries so great. And now it was that I began to keep a journal of every day's employment, for indeed, at first I was in too much hurry, and not only hurry as to labor, but in too much discomposure of mind, and my journal would have been full of many dull things, for example, I must have said thus, on the 30th, after I got to shore and escaped drowning, instead of being thankful to God for my deliverance, having first vomited, with the great quantity of salt water which had got into my stomach, and recovering myself a little, I ran about the shore wringing my hands and beating my head and face, exclaiming at my misery, and crying out, I was undone, undone, till, tired and faint, I was forced to lie down on the ground to repose, but durst not sleep for fear of being devoured. Some days after this, and after I had been on board the ship and got all that I could out of her, yet I could not forbear getting up to the top of a little mountain and looking out to sea, in hopes of seeing a ship. Then fancy at a vast distance I spied a sail, pleased myself with the hope of it, and then after looking steadily till I was almost blind, lose it quite, and sit down and weep like a child, and thus increase my misery by my folly. 
But having gotten over these things in some measure, and having settled my household staff and habitation, made me a table and a chair, and all as handsome about me as I could, I began to keep my journal, of which I shall here give you the copy, though in it will be told all these particulars over again, as long as it lasted, for having no more ink, I was forced to leave it off. End of chapter 4